Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very empowering show coming right up with special guest, Dawn Dina Bradley. And she's here today to share with us her new book, Living Full Circle, Simple Ancient Rituals for Modern Life. Dawn Dina is an expert in identifying the benefits of holistic health practices and translating them into practical approaches that people can adopt in their lives. She has spent thousands of hours challenging teams to deliver breakthroughs in health and wellness innovations in diverse cultures at a number of Fortune 500 companies. And she has shared her conviction at TEDx Orange Coast in the talk, Let's Create a Society Addicted to Health. Her formal education includes a Doctor of Philosophy in Food Science from The Ohio State University and a Master of Science in Nutrition from Purdue University. So let's welcome to the show, Don Dina Bradley. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about your new book. Oh my goodness. I mean, I love this book. Absolutely enjoyed reading it and learned a lot. And I have to ask you, like, what inspired you to write this book? Wow. I would say it was the experience that I had as I was in the holistic healing certification course. As you can imagine, I was surrounded by 20, 30 eager individuals to try to take in new ways of healing. And as that was happening, I found myself sketching and trying to find ways to make it more practical into my own life. And that sparked a whole host of conversations with other individuals that were in the course. And it's kind of a part of me and my DNA. And so off we went in just really trying to make these rituals, which to me are timeless, um, very applicable to anyone at any time, very accessible, very affordable, which was my goal. Well, I love how the book, I mean, the subtitle is Simple Ancient Rituals for Modern Life. And so I'm really curious, how did this become an important part of your journey and subsequently a focus of the book? That's a great question. And I could answer that from so many different experiences that I've had in my life. I would say just going back to the basics Um, For me, as you can appreciate, being in a corporate role and being maniacally focused on a certain initiative, but yet being exposed to extraordinary amount of problems that seem to persist in society, locally and globally, whether you want to talk about the, just the obesity incidents or individuals living with diabetes or just what I would say chronic pain. And, you know, unfortunately, as as much as there's an investment in these types of just day-to-day, you know, unfortunate experiences that individuals have, people are looking for ways to feel better as opposed to being labeled, I have a chronic disease. And, you know, the inspiration really just came from what I started to witness in terms of simple things that people could do that would make an impact in a day, you know, in a day and to feel just a little bit better. Um, And so I've always had that as part of my own passion and mission. I think in, in terms of any role that I've had of being for the individual, the human, and I've always kind of pushed back on you know, what I know is important traditional language and a marketing mindset of a target audience or a consumer or even a patient. And so this was just my opportunity to be for the human and in essence, try to bring forward those things that affect both, you know, the spirit and the mind and the body. Yeah. How important is that? And, you know, and for our listeners are going, gosh, what does it mean you know, living full circle. I'd love for you to share that with us. That's something that emerged um, in terms of, you know, coming full circle, right? In terms of finding something that you knew would work maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And 
you neglected and left it behind. So for me, there was just this theme that constantly emerged around, hey, this ritual or this approach to solving a problem uh, seems very simple, but yet we forget about it. And so for, so as an example, um, just growing up in a home where, you know, I talk about this a lot around sitting at the kitchen table and, and hearing my parents try to find solutions for my grandmother who was living with diabetes and suffered, you know, with her eyesight and an amputated toe and were, you know, in essence, in a conversation about what dessert can she eat? You know, angel cake really became kind of the middle of the the essence of the conversation. And so here I am you know, 20, 30 years later, and on one hand, we're more educated, but I don't necessarily see um, the advance that I would hope given all individuals rolling up their sleeves and trying to find problems for, you know, what people experience on a day-to-day basis. And so for me, that was living full circle. I started out wanting to find a solution that was better. I spent a lot of time in my career just understanding systems and how to bring solutions forward. And in essence, in some cases, they're just right there, you know, in front of an individual, but they don't even really appreciate or know that that can work. And so I guess that's a long winded way to say, I just feel like there's these cycles of solutions that get left behind. And my hope was to bring things that forward that are timeless, um, but we kind of forget about, but yet when we do them religiously, they tend to have a, a real impact on our ability to, to solve a problem that we live with. I don't know if that makes sense, but the, um, that's oh, yeah. been consistent thing for me. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And when we look at just, you know, you know, our journeys in particular, a lot of times we do know some of this ancient knowledge, we might have heard about it or know a little bit about this. And so it's nice to have these reminders to go, hey, you know, you could use this to move your move your life forward. Right. I think the other thing that's a little bit different about how I approached um, this book, if you will, was I put it in context of an individual and how they might be on a path in solving a problem. So as an example, if you're not exposed to some of um, these rituals, just in terms of grounding and breath work or thinking about stretching a little bit differently or paying attention to um, your tongue, if you will, and, and the color change that feels very foreign versus going to an you know your your doc your traditional doctor and thinking about pain relief and so my intent was to break this down into kind of 10 segments if you will that really began with grounding in the breath and ending and spiraling you know spiraling up I call it healing from the inside outward and and noticing that's really what happens in nature right that's how trees and the ocean and all, you know, all the things around us spiral in growth. And so I was hoping to break that down into more bite sized pieces, if you will, and, and have individuals pay more attention to their own cycle, if you will, and try to hone in on those areas that they may not have thought to pay attention to that could just be introduced into their daily routines. Well, since you brought up trees, I'm I'm going to ask my next question here <laughs> because you, you your first chapter kind of really dives into grounding, and I'd love for you to share with us why that's important. Well, grounding connects the body and the mind through breath. I really believe that. I think naturally we take a deep breath when we're overwhelmed, and for me, thinking about grounding and roots being very rooted um, is the beginning of paying attention to the signals in your body when you know you need to take a pause and listen to your breath. So in that kind of framework, I wanted to just talk about breath IQ and scanning breath. And, you know, a simple question is, should I breathe through my mouth or my nose? And while to a lot of individuals who are deeply immersed in yoga and breath work, my finding when I was out, you know, kind of in, in areas with people who really hadn't been exposed to that, just 
breaking that down and talking about the breath and connecting the body and mind really does make you feel calm and more grounded and understanding what grounded means for me as an individual or for a friend um, who may feel a little bit different, but to be able to talk about that and, and go to that first when we feel stressed versus maybe in an emotional, you know, overwhelm or which can lead to drama, as you know. So trees for me is, um, you know, such a great metaphor in terms of their role and, and deeply rooted and providing that kind of natural grounding, if you will. And um, so I wanted to start with that. I think that's such a great place to start and start the discussion because a lot of times, I mean, how disassociated we become from the breath, we get the shallow breathing, you know, we're not taking the full belly breaths. And a lot of times it's, really kind of around our anxiety and stress. Right. And that for me, you know, kind of led into even the other cues. Not only are we not necessarily always listening to our breath, we don't necessarily scan how our body feels, right? Even our joints and um, just tending to our body in simple, you know, techniques um, knowing where our liver is and feeling that that side, you know, that right side of you, if you really pay attention, your liver may feel off. And that's a signal to kind of help us mobilize and the wheels, if you will, of what our body needs. And um, so to your point, for me, grounding allows us to listen better and to pay more attention to all of the parts of us that create us, you know, holistically. Okay. So in each of your chapters, you have what's called a personal spotlight. What is that? And why don't you share one for us that, you know, kind of stands out for you? So my intention was to illuminate the individuals that I know are doing their own work, um, in the various fields. And, you know, as I shared, I tried to create a book that kind of dipped a toe into a variety of areas, as opposed to an entire book being about breath work or um, other techniques, if you will. And I wanted to honor what I would call individuals who are masters at what they do. I don't pretend to be a master at any of this. It was my intent to translate it into something that allowed people to, you know, maybe feel a little bit better and then be motivated to dive deeper um, into those areas. And so for me, these spotlights were almost a story about, you know, something that was real and personal to these individuals who decided to make a change in their life and, by making that change as hard as it may have been at the time, their reflection on it, their testimony, if you will, just were so motivating and inspiring for me. I wanted to, you know, create a space in the book and ultimately in other places that I can talk about it uh, for these, what I would say, warriors of humanity. Um, Gosh, it's hard to pick a favorite. Um, I guess I would talk about, I want to talk about all of them, but if, if I were to pick, one, an individual um, named Daria, she was someone who I've known for quite a while and encouraged, and she did this course a year in advance before I did. And um, she does my hair, so we'd see each other every eight to 10 weeks. And we talk about um, just the learning of this and translating it into rituals and just had such a passion for it. So her story, you know, is kind of highlighted twice in terms of looking back a year later. um, She had an extraordinary struggle with a lot of things in her life that she could not find answers for. And we could spend a whole hour talking about that, but it's a very common theme that keeps coming up is I had this pain. I don't really know where it's originating for or, uh, I have horrible skin and it's it's really tough to get a handle on it or I can't sleep. I have, you know, horrible <laughs> insomnia. And so Daria actually, this spotlight focuses on what she, how she shifted her morning and how she even shifted her, the food that she ate and, 
even seasonally what she would do differently and just the remarkable uh, results that she had in taking back her health. And um, there's a little bit of that in all of them. I think if I were to add one more, um, Joya Weeks is someone that I met at a leadership weekend who also had, you know, gone through her own vigilant approach to answers with her own body. And what I love about her um, is she started to really own her own energy and be accountable for the energy that she put out into the world. And every time I would see her, just the consistency that she would have in who she was and owning the energy that she put in and the boundaries that she um, put around her own um, approach to life and what she wouldn't allow, you know, allow in, so to speak. And um, again, that was just another example where that just made a difference in her ability to show up as her best self. Um, so those are two examples. I'd love to talk about all of them, but um, those are two <laughs> of my, my, that made a real impression on me. Yeah. I mean, I, there are many of them throughout your book that I was like, oh my gosh, I so relate to this. Or I know people that you know, are dear friends of mine that can relate to this as well. And so it's not something that's so far-fetched. I mean, most people will either have it going on or know somebody that does. Right. Yeah, I can hear um, Julia in my ear, you know, talking about you have to stop being a victim of your body and you really need to kind of um, take a different approach, which that that chapter on zoning for me, we hear a lot about energy management. Um, if you dig deeper, you understand chakras in your body and how energy flows through your body. And she just really brought that to life for me in a way that I felt as I described that to someone who's kind of new to energy management in that context, it started to be more relatable, this whole idea of zoning and kind of decluttering and and rezoning, if you will, um, and thinking about it as boundaries. Uh, I'm so glad that you brought that up because, you know, one of the questions that I have for you too, I mean, your book talks about this and it's very intriguing. And I think a lot of people that know about chakras may know something about this, but a lot of times, you know, we just kind of don't remember. It's like we go throughout our day, we get so busy, we don't remember. And you talk about how our energies will interweave with those that we, you know, come in contact with. And how does that how can we maintain it so that we're not carrying somebody else's baggage with us everywhere we go? Oh, wow. That's, that's something that I have to keep reminding myself because I can feel the weight um, of a lot of other individuals problems. And I, so I constantly have to clear my, my energy, if you will. Um, Well, here's how I, here's how I would just kind of level set with that. If you, you know, studied the rainbow and Roy G. Biv. Um, for me, that's really the spinning wheels of energy that are, you know, in our body. And, you know, I think I kind of go through the, you know, Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And each of those um, kind of stand for a different location on your body. And so for me, I remember when I started to take the course and while I had studied energy management before, I had this wonderful um, bracelet, if you will, that had all those colors of the, of the rainbow. And I would, you know, I would hold on to the red one and, and, you know, that's down, you know, really in your root chakra. And I would say, you know, I am steady and I'm grounded and I would listen to my body and and make sure that I really believe that. And I would go through each of those, whether I was in the shower or just taking a quiet moment or on the subway, I would start to really pay attention to each of those zones, if you will. And I would get quiet in those zones. And to answer your question, when I can get quiet, I know what's mine and I know what's not mine. And I'm, I feel like I have a lot of empathy for people And I'm in, you know, my lesson in life has been, I tend to take on others, maybe problems or be that empathetic ear, even more sometimes of putting myself last on the list. And so from that perspective, I would constantly scan um, 
these, you know, energy zones. And I would make sure I know kind of where my energy starts and where others, you know, the stop and start of that, because I do know we are interwoven networks of energy. We are interconnected and it's just really important to pay attention to your own energy and and know when you need to kind of regroup and reground around those zones. Yeah. It's so important. I mean, because when you think about, you know, clearing the clutter that's in our space, a lot of times people just think about our homes or our work, places like that, not really their energetic space. Right. And the more you, you know, better understand kind of your own energy pattern, the more you really can direct your own kind of unique demands, right? The, the more you can show up and be your best self and have that confidence in that. One of my favorite things to do um, early on was that good vibe poem um, in terms of each sound that those different energy zones have affiliated with them in terms of, oh, ooh, ah, a. Eh. Like I would, I would, really try to take the sound and tie it to the the color and to the location on my body to a point that it became intuitive. I built that into my practice. And so I can quickly scan my body and, and make sure and, and to know where I am, which allows me to kind of understand if I'm in a, you know, a, getting ready to go into a meeting that's really important in terms of how I show up in my professionalism I I need to know kind of where I am on that energy scale. Right. Um, Or even, you know, going out for a run, if you will. But um, anyhow, that's a zoning is a, to me, one of the, you know, most critical parts of kind of that journey from grounding to, to spiraling up. And, um, you know, it obviously leads to being able to kind of shift and transition and, and kind of build new routines into your daily life. Yeah, that's so important. You know, and you talk about in your book, my goodness, I mean, you've got so many wonderful things for us to cover here, but you talk about like really spending time on like rejuvenating the body. And and you talked about a little bit earlier about, you know, hey, let's let's look at the liver and how's your liver feeling? Why is that important? Why do we need to be checking in that way? I think of our body as a container that just does these wonderful, remarkable things every day. And we just think that's going to keep going. Um, And for me, why it's important is to understand how to sustain it in, in the most efficient um, nurturing way. And I know I feel better um, when I have a sense of where my body's showing up or where it's not and how do I pause and tend to that. And sometimes I think we just go, go, go and kind of collapse at night and our feet are doing their thing. Um, our, our liver and our whole digestive system is trying to keep up with, with all of that, our adrenals and you know, all the cortisol that's being produced. Like that, that's a machine that just, is working and working until it stops, right? Or until it starts to kind of go a little off. And so for me, knowing my body, understanding the relationship of some of um, the different functions of of the body um, enables me to pay more attention and and shift in in a way that um, keeps me from burning out or um, just keeps me feeling better in the course of a day. Yeah, it's so important. And, you know, it's a great reminder that people can do these check-ins, you know, with themselves and see where they're at. It's not something that, you know, they can just ignore or only have to go to a doctor to figure out. They can kind of do a personal check-in. Well, right. And and also I I like to um, experiment with how I feel in nature and the natural rhythm of the seasons. And so, you know, one of the things I experienced in the course that I took with others is we would do a a detox, if you will, of transition from, you know, summer to fall or fall to winter. And it, you know, it'd be a three day liver rejuvenation, if you will. And that in its own right, you know, preparing it going from, from winter where at least where I live would be, you know, dark and, and damp and cold. Um, your body starts to 
need a little bit more help in transitioning into that, so to speak. And so it just, you know, it started to really help me pay attention, if you will, of, of what I could do that was more practical, that was simple in effect, um, to shift versus eating the same thing every day and being in the same routine, which sometimes can be build kind of t- put you in a rut, if you will, if you're, if you're not paying attention to it. Yeah, it's easy to get in these routines that don't really serve us well. And you've you've kind of talked about, you know, routines in, in general. Are there new ways that our listeners can start establishing new routines so that, you know, they don't get stuck in that rut and they're identifying them, I think, which is important. Yeah, I love the chapter talking about kind of owning, right? Noticing what flows. Um and this, uh, this concept of electronic prison, um, Marianne O'Brien is spotlighted and it's someone who's made me really aware of Wi-Fi and, you know, the, the constant bombardment that we have of just the electronic field that we live in. And um, I'm not sure who termed that phrase electronic prison, but it just, if you think about that, and and how we're wired right now to be connected from a, from a technology perspective. And yet our own energy wants to kind of be connected to each other. But if we're, we're isolated, there is a, a, a something to be said for doing um, just some alignment with the sun setting or the sun rising or paying attention to, just detoxing from all of the bombardment that we have of EMFs. I'm not an expert on EMFs, but I can tell you, I I was one day I was doing a quick run in New York and I had on my Apple watch and this gentleman stopped me and he's like, do you realize like you're just bombarding yourself? That's not really helping you. And, and ordinarily I would just like run on by and just kind of wave, wave to this, this gentleman, he was, he was a younger man and it was near a hospital and he had on a kind of some, some, uh, wardrobe pieces that would, that would let me know he's kind of in the medical field and he was so passionate about it. And it just got me to think about, um, how we sleep with our phones by our bed and, um, at least put the phone in the drawer, put it on airplane mode. Um, but that was, that was kind of an area that, um, I hadn't really paid attention before and I didn't even really think about that causing brain fog or some other things. And I could feel a difference in my body when I started to think differently about protecting myself um, against that, so to speak. Yeah. It's so amazing when we have just something so simple as maybe switching where our phones are that can make such a huge impact in our lives. Right. Well, establishing different types of structure that kind of enables your your natural body to 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 sink if you will and um you know hopefully there's some ways to establish new tra- uh, new routines with these practices um and and think differently about our connection to nature so when we have significant you know really big significant life changes that occur how should we identify those and use those to our benefit? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. I (laughs) just hit you with it, right? (laughs) You did. did. In in essence, I feel like I'm living it. Um, Living full circle, right? So this idea of starting a new, a new role, a, a new job, I've taken on a role that's more of a global role. I'm traveling um, internationally and I notice what happens when my body's trying to adapt to a new time zone. And I just um, decided to go down and, and spend 30 minutes eating by myself and just really having a mindful meal, if you will. Um, I haven't had a lot of sweet sleep as you kind of live into a time zone. And, um, as I sat there, my body was talking to me. Um, and I was just having a lot of gratitude for being able to take that time. Um, but if I weren't practicing that for myself, I would probably be, you know, diving into the emails and, um, just go, go, go and getting as much done as I, as I can on the work front versus stepping back and reflecting and taking some time for myself so I can, 
um, show up and, and look, you know, engaged and radiant and, and not as necessarily as drained as sometimes, you know, it can be when, when you're shifting uh, time zones, but um, it's a, it's a great question. I think stress, um, we talk about the stress busters in our life, right? The change of a job, um, a new marriage, having a baby, um, all of these things happen and, you know, they're extraordinary adjustments and, and critical for us to step back and listen to our bodies and, and pay attention and, and try not to get overwhelmed by it, but just do one simple thing, just one thing that can make, you know, a difference and in, in a noticeable you know, difference in helping you feel better. For me, that's been always kind of the the cue for me. Well, did that make me feel better? Whoa, like, wow, that was a simple change I could make that uh, paid off for me. Um, and, and so anyway, I, as I'm going through significant changes um, for myself, I feel like I've learned to slow down um, as opposed to speed up and try to command and demand it all. I've, I, I'm finding I'm, I'm stepping back and, um, uh, trying to take it in, in smaller bites, if you will. Yeah, that's so important. I, I really felt that living full circle helped me because I, you know, I look at, you know, you talked about devices. I mean, I'm guilty of that. I have mine sitting right next to my bed. My sleep has been somewhat horrible. So since then, after you know, like you know, kind of getting into the book, I've actually moved it and it's helped improve my sleep, which improves everything. <laughs> It does. <laughs> Glad you did that. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what can happen when you have a good night's sleep, right? <laughs> so. Well, and even for me, getting up 15 minutes early, um, just having that opportunity to have a quiet um, moment of just being grateful, um, paying attention to what's kind of where the racing mind goes and you know, I, I have, I like, I want to keep my feet in, in shape so I can run, um, hopefully for a while. Cause that's one of the best places I think and integrate. So I pay attention to my joints and my feet and rub oil on them and all that good stuff. And, but that required me to take just 15 more minutes or build different structure in my day that would really prompt me to do that. And when I don't do that, um, I notice, um, that I'm not feeling as great as I do when I do, commit to it. So where could our listeners connect with you and learn not just about your book, but be part of your community? Well, I am building a website that's up uh, at dondina.com and I'm certainly available on, on social media. I, my intent is to start to blog and write about these things and post these things more regularly, but really putting a spotlight on stories and, and people. And, you know, I want to hear about that, but every two weeks I am starting to take, start with the, the 10 that are in kind of this book um, in honor of their work. And gosh, since this um, book has been published, practically all of the individuals that I've highlighted are doing some even more remarkable things. It's really, it's really fascinating to watch that. And so to your point, I, my hope is just to allow people to connect to with each other and witness each other's growth and take the things that um, can work in your own life. And when you try them and hopefully be a, a source of, uh, of stories and testimonies, if you will, for, for people. So I'm, I'm really building that to, you know, be really honest with you. This is new to me. I didn't set out to write a book. Um, I set out to, translate something for myself and the people around me just encouraged and uh, motivated me to start to put that together. And I just feel like it's been such a gift to go through that process. And so uh, now I need to figure out what is the best way to, to unite this community. And um, so stay tuned, but for now uh, you can kind of see this start to grow on Dondina.com. Well, Dondina, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, I love talking about this. And so just thank you for enabling that and appreciate the time that you took to read it. And uh, it means a lot to me. Well, thank you, Don Dina. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, Living Full Circle. Living Full Circle is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. If you'd like to connect with Don Dina, you can at her website, dondina.com, for more information. 
Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Mary Ann is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus and grow, Mary Ann will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just what moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Friday and Saturday at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.